Welcome back and thanks so much for staying with ANN7 Prime. I'm Cindy Mabi. Justice for Ahmed Timo, 45 years after his death, Judge Bali Motle ruled that the anti-apartheid activist did not commit suicide but was indeed murdered while, while in police custody in 1971. And the ruling has now opened the way for other families whose loved ones died in police custody. Judge Billy Mortley had harsh words for former security police members, saying that they had fabricated their version of events in order to cover up the murder of Ahmed Tamol. The judgment was met with tears and applause. Timol did not jump out of the window of room 1026, but was either pushed out of the window of room 1026 or from the roof of the John Foster Square building. Thus, he did not commit suicide, but was murdered. Yeah, I think I think uh, a huge sigh of relief, as uh, Judge Billy Motley was reading out the judgment, uh, concluding with the statement that my uncle did not commit suicide, but that he was killed in police custody. It's something that I had always believed in, and as a family, we had no doubt about it. But I think just to hear those words of Judge Billy Motley for the first time, pronouncing it in a democratic South Africa, that the inquest findings of 1972 are going to be reversed, totally, totally overwhelming. Uh, difficult to grasp, still struggling to absorb it, and perhaps in another day or so after reading the actual judgment, it will actually sink in. I am pleased to have been a party to the attempts made by the people that have worked for more than two and a half years to bring this back because before this wonderful judge. Thank you very much to all of you and I hope that what has happened today will happen in a way in re relation to the other 65 people. We will be there f for them. Judge Billy Motley noted that his judgment has now put a spotlight on all other cases where death in detention was ruled as a suicide. We want to, to, to ex extremely appreciate what the Timor family has done for our revolution uh, in, in seeking the truth for their loved one. And we think that this, this, this important judgment, uh, uh, it's a landmark judgment that should be applauded, that should actually be truly fulfilled uh, in all its uh, versions as presented by the judge today. The family needs closure and nothing more else other than closure because the circumstances surrounding Matthew Mabilani's death, exactly similar to Timor's. A packed courtroom witnessed a historic judgment, but a clear call has gone out, not only within the recommendations and the judgment, but from the Timor family and civil and political organizations, that the government needs to start assisting families who are still looking for answers and closure in the loss of their loved ones. Valerie Robinson, ANN7, Pretoria. And joining us uh, on the line is Rapulane Mabalane, family member of uh, Matthew Mabalane, who died similarly in 1977 by uh, police claiming that he fell from the 10th floor of the police holding cells. And Ms. Siritian is a South African Liberty Foundation chairperson on the line. Oliver Dixon is a political uh, analyst. And Dr. Marjorie Jobson is with Kulumani Support Group as their national director. And Reneva Furi is with the South African Communist Party as their central committee member. And you at home, you must welcome to join us on social media. Good evening to you and thanks so much for, for joining us. Let's start with you, Rapulane. Um, in, in the Timur case, uh, suppose, would give you a sense of hope that there would be justice for your family as well. But very briefly, if you can tell us about the life of Matthew and how he met his demise. All right, uh, I believe Mr. Babalan is not there yet. Let's go to Dr. Jobson with Kulumani Support Group. Just off air, you were giving us mm -hmm. a profile of the work that you do, 104,000 uh, cases that you're investigating of people wanting closure whose right. families had died mm -hmm. under mysterious circumstances during apartheid. In a nutshell, what, how, how do you go about trying to seek justice for, for these families? Well, the biggest issue is that the TRC closed on the 14th of December 1997, before the majority of people had had a chance to table their statements with the TRC. And so people demanded from Kulumani that we start taking their statements. We've built a huge database. We organized in every province with uh, provincial steering committees and then ac activities to try and 
um, support the restoration of people's dignity and their capacity building for economic activities. Mm. And, and Runeva, do you think the timing of having at least civil, civil organizations dealing with the injustices of the past and how we move society forward is a better approach as a maturing democracy as, as opposed to it being politicized? Um, I think that the timing is, is ab absolutely perfect for a number of reasons, but primarily because it, there seems to be um, a lack of knowledge of our history, particularly amongst the born frees, and also because of the restrictions that we had during the era of apartheid. Surprisingly, many South Africans are not aware of the atrocities. So as the country is going through a bit of a difficult period where we're seeing a resurgence of racism, I think the timing of, of this hearing is absolutely perfect. It creates a consciousness of the past and um, it firms the importance of us remaining a united and non-racial South Africa. Mm. Mm -hmm. and it could also you know, conjure certain images or memories that some South Africans simply don't want to hear. Mm. You know, if you buy into the whole ideology of a rainbow nation and that if you bring up issues of inequality, poverty, racism, that you're being divisive, because we would very much rather would have the blinkers on the work clubbers and pretend that these things don't exist. So for the so-called born freeze or younger generation as a political analyst, how do you take all of this in? I mean, 45 years later, we see the Ahmed Timmel family finally getting the justice they deserve. What does it mean to you? A big misconception we have in society is that uh, people born after the, the, the end of apartheid or people born uh, towards the end of it uh, don't live with the emotional scars of apartheid. Uh, and that's not true. I may not have lived most of my life uh, in an oppressive regime like that, but I certainly do bear the scars of that. I certainly do have to listen to stories of family members who lost husbands and wives uh, due to police brutality, due, due to the oppressive nature of the uh, apartheid uh, 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 police. And those, those that pain and that uh, insecurity and tragedy carries through generations and we certainly live with that today. Uh, we certainly have our own uh, a form of that that visits us every now and then uh, when, we, when we have to inhale tear gas and, and endure rubber bullets during fees must fall protest. For us that's certainly an indication that wait, we may not have gone past uh, a, an oppressive police state. Um, and I think we certainly, we certainly then have to draw back and look at resemblances, uh, you know, and, and a lot of that resemblance is what's happening. A, a lot of what happened during Fees Must Fall just seems so uh, um, in, in the same fashion of what the apartheid uh, uh, government uh, policed it at the time. And so a lot of things go unanswered. A lot of our comrades who were, who, who were protesting in, in, in Fees Must Fall were arrested for no reason at all, were arrested, but no one knew that they were arrested. Uh, and this, this, is, this is exactly what Chris Van Veek spoke about in detention uh, when, when he wrote that poem. Um, it's, it's those sorts of things that we need to be cautious of, and we can only learn from court cases like these. We can only learn when the truth really comes out about court cases like this. So this is a, a symbolic milestone, at least for us, going forward with whatever revolution we hold, whatever revolutionary direction we hold right now. Mm. All right, let's get a view from the South African Liberty Foundation, the uh, chairperson, Monsieur Etziane. Good evening to you and thanks so much for joining us. I mean, it's uh, definitely going to be the floodgates, uh, so to speak, of other families who've been denied mm. uh, justice for so long. Uh, seeing uh, this victory, uh, this is a semblance of hope that at least somebody will be held accountable for the loss of their loved ones. But in the interest of or the preamble of uh, the Bill of Rights and our Constitution saying that we need to deal with the injustices of the past and redress that. You, you know, it's, it's, it's overdue that we get to this point, albeit uh, um, uncomfortable or, you know, we may not necessarily be ready for it. I think we may not be ready for it. If one can look at it, we, there was an action group which went all over to the USA wanting to institute a civil action I think it was during the time when Tabo Mbegi was the president at that time. There was a, an initiation that wanted to on call to be pursued against particularly the companies that are beneficiaries of, of apartheid that in one way or the other have influenced and persuaded our suffering as blacks in general. The Ford Motors, you can name them, coca Colas and so forth. Those that were in support of the then apartheid regime. Our atrocities have not yet come out as yet. Twenty years in democracy, we needed to forgive. But when we try to do that, you, you have people like Johan Rupert, 
who seems to be holding on to what seems to have been that the gains of those that were made during apartheid, they themselves are refusing to share the wealth of this country. So this is just the tip of an iceberg. It's an action that is needed. We need to move forward. We cannot let it be that bygones be bygones, let's forgive and forget, let's live harmoniously in peace. We are not in peace in South Africa. We are constantly suffering as black people in general. The atrocities of apartheid. Whatever has happened in this case, it's just an, a mere eye-opener of what has happened to majority of blacks in particular about the atrocity that they suffered while in custody of the South African police services in the apartheid era. But I want to differ with a, a former or a panelist who is there, who seems to want to compare this system. They are completely incomparable. You can never compare what we have today. Today we have human rights. We have, we have a, a way in which you can address if you have a, a, a manner in which you are dissatisfied with the police. You've got a system that you can even report the atrocities against the police. You can take them to court. You yeah, can do but whatever. Said, yes, but I, I suppose from a younger generation, it's your lived experiences and not firsthand uh, what may have uh, happened to you know the older generation during apartheid. But I just want to focus on the job that Kulumani Support Group does and why that is not supported adequately. I'm not sure even if you do have the necessary capacity and resources. Just in the interest of, again, justice and restoring uh, dignity and humanity. Do you have the, the necessary support? I mean, if you're still sitting with 104,000 cases post-94 or 95, it suggests that uh, they, they, there's a lack um, of resources there. Um, you know, the biggest issue was that the recommendations of the Truth Commission were never fully implemented or wholeheartedly implemented. And in the end, only 16,000 people got reparations and then qualify for educational assistance and when you know some of our members who did get the special number that allows you to apply for these um, benef benefits I mean we, we are producing actuaries and chartered accountants but that's a very small proportion of the victims who should get the same equal treatment so the whole system has been very very distorted and in fact our minister Masuta has said it represents the gravest injustice to victims. You mentioned the preamble in the Constitution, those who suffered for freedom and democracy, we will honor and respect them. But um, that hasn't happened. And um, the man from the Liberty Foundation spoke about our case that went to New York. And we were in court for 14 years trying to hold multinationals uh, companies that broke the United Nations embargoes and profited from their dealings with these companies in South Africa, accountable for aiding and abetting the continuation of apartheid long before it was basically a bankrupt system. Mm. And we, co we couldn't win the case because the U.S. government changed the statute that we used so that they could only um, uh, try cases where the human rights violations happened on U.S. territory. So it was a closing down of a very important space in international human rights, which is actually what tends to happen with the U.S. government. You know, mm. But can we say the same maybe in South Africa, in modern South Africa, democratic as it is, or claim to be, um, that there, there's still a concerted effort in pretty much keeping things the way they were in the good old days yeah. and not mm -hmm. wanting to create a, a egalitarian society that is more equal and uh, that can confront its bitter past and, and demons uh, so that we get forward in, in society. I believe you might, from a, a communist point of view, I'm sure you'd agree mm -hmm. that more can be done um, in how we deal with inequality and Look. injustice. I want to begin by saying that post-1994, really, in, in all honesty, a lot has been done. Um, if, if For those of us that lived under conditions of apartheid that were restricted in terms of movement, that um, witnessed the, skew the racially skewed distribution of resources and economic development, um, we, we feel that post-1994, uh, there's been significant strides made by the ANC-led government with regards to economic development and the spreading of, 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 of equity. Of course, the poverty levels and inequality levels and un unemployment levels um, remain high, uh, but we're part of, a, of an international platform. So, um, yes, there needs to be accelerated economic redress, but true, um, 
With regards to us moving too quickly towards a rainbow nation, towards embracing a national identity without addressing the wounds of the past, I do agree with you that um, many things have been overlooked. And this Timor inquest was really an eye-opener because it, it, it demonstrated to us how deep the pain still is amongst many South African citizens. We also got a lot of calls um, at the office of the Communist Party um, from families whose, whose, uh, who the death of their family members are, are still unexplained. I still have friends whose deaths are unexplained. Um, last week I was at the Fredimo conference. There was a lot of ex unexp unexplained um, intervention. Uh, in, uh, even Samora Mashal's death is unexplained. So, yes, we, we need to confront our past. Uh, and I wanted to piggyback on the point that you made of, of government resources. We think that this, by far, the, the government resources dedicated to this process is by far inadequate. We need to have a dedicated unit that is going to investigate these deaths. It doesn't need to be family initiated. It's, it's already um, contained in the TRC. So we need to get to the bottom, we need to have history rectified, um, and we need to facilitate a process where, as a nation, we can heal. Mm. And, and how do you do that without it being racially biased or discriminatory? Okay. Well, there were... <laughs> I mean, I mean, some very interesting things are emerging at the moment because um, our chairperson, for instance, does a lot of the teaching in uh, different universities on decolonization. And so we were approached by the leadership of the Dutch Reformed Church who finally want to face their role in supporting the theology that underpinned apartheid. And so we've, we've actually had an extraordinary um, gathering last week um, with people becoming completely vulnerable and open to beginning to comprehend the consequences of what they supported. You know, and actually some of these leaders, the provincial leaders in this church, were people who were in the helicopter shooting the protesters at Sharpful, and they were in the police station in Tokoza, where people were, you know, bodies, there were bodies in that virtual civil war. And so it was like, facing it in a very, very real way. So I'm hopeful that there is a growing willingness to actually account. It's all about accounting and, and really taking responsibility and making redress. Mm. And the, the question that, you, that you're raising about racism, it, it is so fundamental because um, I was v visiting one of the museums outside of South Africa that looked at apartheid. And I was sharing with um, those liberation uh, leaders that one of my fears is that if our young people must really know how brutal apartheid was, I mean, the absolute, absolute truth, if they must really know what we had been exposed to, um, it will ignite a severe racial tension in the country. But I think what is important for, for people to realize is that the struggle was not black against white. It was a struggle against the system. Um, it was a non-racial struggle that the, the ANC, the SSCP, um, other liberation movements, but the, the Congress movement was hegemonic, was a non-racial movement that comprised um, even white people. And then also the implementers of apartheid were not just white. We, at the Timul inquest, we saw some of the policemen uh, or at least one um, was black, mm. so we shouldn't look at view it as a as a as a racial um, categorization, but a system, a system that we must be conscious of, and a system that we must never go back to. All right, uh, hold that thought, please. We'll come to your response, Mr. Dixon. We have uh, Rapulane Mabalane, family member of uh, the late Matthews. Mabalane, who uh, died a in the, under similar suspicious circumstances in 1977 by police claiming he fell from the 10th floor uh, of the police holding cells. Mr. Mabalane, thanks so much for, for your time. So how, how far closer are you to, to getting the, uh, to the bottom of how your, your, your family member died? Thank you, ma'am, and thanks for the interview. <clears throat> I think today's judgment opened up a chance for us to can also find closure, especially 
Uh, my dad, who is 95 years of age now, who can be delighted if he could be taken to court and listen to the proceedings so that when next he passes on, at least he knows what happens to his son. So we all delighted as a family, more, more so as the judge proved it beyond reasonable doubt that the security branch personnel were behind Timor's death and, cons and subsequently to Matthew Mabilani's death. Mm. No, we, we at the, suppose you, you vindicated as you're saying, but it's, uh, it's still, you know, it took so long, uh, at least to get to this point. It's encouraging that hopefully not only the sergeants or the foot soldiers or those who took instruction from uh, their generals and ministers would be held accountable, but that it, it, it is at least uh, a little bit uh, a wider scope. Uh, Mr. Dixon, your, your view um, on just the deracialization of how we, we deal with the past. I know it almost sounds like an oxymoron, but... Yeah, I think um, our history is entirely racial. Our present is still entirely racial. And for a long time, our future will remain racial uh, because, again, uh, resources are still distributed uh, in, or at least are still retained in a racial pattern. Uh, we, th we think access to, to uh, things that create justice. You know, when you think about justice, justice needs to encompass a number of things. Restoration, reparation, closure. Uh, if, if any of those three things are absent from justice, then it's no justice at all. South Africans still suffer from the restoration and reparations part. South Africans still suffer from the closure part. So we, we have very little justice as well. It's, 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 not, it's not good enough to say we have a constitution that embodies human rights uh, and, 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 and is non-racial when that constitution has done very little for allowing the 104 mm -hmm. cases, for instance, uh, to, to one be heard for those cases to be resolved and for those families to receive restorative justice, reparative justice and closure. Um, many members in my family, for instance, s still sit without closure. Uh, still, uh, 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 their the immediate surroundings and immediate conditions still remind them of the exact brutality uh, of the apartheid regime. Um, you know, and, and closure can't be real without restoration. Restoration can't be real without closure. They all go in tandem. And I think uh, our constitution assumed that we now begin from a position of a veil of ignorance when that's not really the case. Uh, we, we, we still have to address those things before we can begin from an original position of equality. Yeah, D Dr. Jobson, if, how then does this become, uh, I suppose, one of those imperatives uh, as we have other pillars of um, social cohesion, health care, education, etc. How then do we do the restorative and the redress issue a priority? Um, well, the, the issue is that there is a special fund that is meant to be for victims. It's called the President's Fund. It has at the moment 1.5 billion rand left in it. The students who are qualifying because a, a relative had a, was recognized by the TRC are getting their tertiary education funded, you know, 70,000 rand a year, but it's helping very few people compared to the pool of people who should have equal access, equal opportunity. Um, so what this minister has done is also ring-fenced 500 million rand of that fund for community reparations. Now there's enormous contestation about what that would look like because um, the TRC at the time that it was held was like shortly after trying to incorporate former homelands into sort of an, one nation and the former homelands, the Bantustans, were very poorly served by the TRC. So the biggest problems and the, the biggest backlog actually exists in the former homelands. And so we've, we've developed, and we're actually meeting with the Department of Justice tomorrow again to argue for an approach to a community reparations that is much, gives much better access to the people who most need it, not always the people who already have a bit of a foot in the door so they can take advantage of the next opportunity because we're just widening the gap, you know, as you're saying, the, 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 the poverty of, of particularly um, victims who made incredible 
stands for resistance against apartheid in rural areas really need very focused help. So we have a partnership with National African Farmers Union around a community-based agricultural reparations program. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's not like things. an overarching theme or system or, you know, a political um, ideology, if you want to call it that, an or doctrine. It, yeah. mm -hmm. An overarching solution, one would be uh, the reclamation and redistribution of land. land. Uh, that would be the first. Mm -hmm. The second would be giving everybody equal opportunity to be economic participants. And the third one would be medical, uh, would be healthcare. But when I talk about healthcare, I'm not just talking about physical medical health care. Uh, I think black people in South Africa, we, we live in one enormous and continuous state of post-traumatic stress disorder that we're not treating um, you know, in, in the right way. There are communities who still live in fear uh, because one, they went to bed every night to the sound of gunshots. They went to bed every night to the smell of tear gas. And when just one, when one little protest triggers those, those same reactions, that post-traumatic stress disorder makes those people live half the quality of life they would have if they, would, if they didn't live in continuous fear because of that. So I think uh, a corrective measure would be one that is holistic in that way. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there, but thanks indeed uh, for mm -hmm. joining us. We'll try and put up the details of your organizations mm -hmm. on our social media mm -hmm. as well. And uh, on the phone line, and I apologize, we didn't have adequate time for all our guests. Re uh, Rapulane Mabalane, family member of Matthews Mabalane, whose uh, a family member died under similar circumstances in 1977. Musiri South African Liberty Foundation chairperson, and Oliver Dixon, political analyst, and Dr. Majori Jobson from Kulumani Support Group, their national director, and Reneva Fouri from the South African Communist Party, their Central Committee member. Thanks again for watching. We're back after this.